Hello and welcome to this list. This is going to be another epic list. I've just done the epic 100 essential prog rock albums. Um, and I made a right pig's ear of it, to use a good English expression. I don't know if, whether in the rest of the world you have that expression, pig's ear. But a pig's ear was made of the last one. I wasn't too happy with it at all. I stumbled, I got bloody Robert Wyatt's name wrong on there. There's all sorts of errors and mistakes as I tried to run through a hundred albums, right? And I had to split that video up into two parts. This one I'm not, this is just, a, a, this is an endurance challenge. You have these people who do these top 10 videos, top 20 videos, I'm going for a hundred, the hundred essential jazz rock albums. Now the problem I had in the last video is I didn't go fast enough, so I'm gonna try and go a bit faster and try and get them all into the same, you know, same video. So are you ready for this jazz rock fans? What are you here for? You're here to hear me read a list out that I've got here. You must be interested in my opinion of what these hundred essential albums are. Some of you might think, well, Andy knows his jazz rock. These might, might pick up some albums that I don't know and I could go and buy them. Other of you might have loads of jazz rock albums. I want to check to see if um, the albums you like are also on the list. And some of them might just be argumentative bastards who just want to pick faults because I haven't picked your favourite jazz rock album. That's all the fun of the show. So are you ready? Depending on who you are, what personality type you are, you know, are you ready? Those of you who are ready to criticise me, if you've got your fingers on the typewriter thing, ready to get in the comments and go, you missed out. Joyous Lake by Pat Martino. And I am, I think. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have. Oh, this list's a waste of time. See, I'm, this is the problem. This is the problem. When you're doing the top 10, you could spend like weeks getting that top 10. With a, with a hundred, it's like herding jazz rock cats into an orderly queue. It's not possible. You know, have you ever tried to herd cats? It's a hard thing. Now imagine cats with jazz rock albums ga gaffer tape to them. This is what this has been like. Jazz rock cats, that's what we're dealing with here. So should we just kick off? Oh, you're being flippant, Andy, because you know it's going to be rubbish. It's going to be rubbish, right? It's just how rubbish will it be? How many mistakes will I make? On the last one, I missed out about five because I couldn't read the big the list. I got my glasses on them. Bloody lists too small to read. Should we just kick off? I'm going to try and get through and not miss any, any of these out now. I'm just going to go. Come on, Andy, you're, you're stalling because you don't want to do it. Because once you start, you can't stop, can you? It's like a Pringles, isn't it? It's like Pringles. Once you start, you can't stop. Once I start now, I can't stop. It's cheating. I have to do it in one big go, 100 albums, and I've got to say something about each album without sounding like an idiot. It's not going to happen. What have I got at number 100? At 100, I have The Golden Age of the Apop Apocalypse by Thundercat. Right, there's going to be a lot of old albums on this list. I wanted to put something new. Thundercat is one of the great, you know, jazz rock albums. Uh, instrumentalists, he's almost become a household name, appearing in like, you know, Star Wars TV series and all this sort of stuff. He crosses over into popular music. I loved his album Drunk, but that was more of a song-based album. The Gold Age of the Apocalypse has been around for longer. Um, I didn't know it that well. I was going to put Drunk here. And I thought, just check these other albums out. I went and listened to this album. I thought, this is fantastic. And it's a little bit more weirder and jazz rocky. So that's what I've got number 100. And that's the amount of time I'm going to spend on each one. At number 99, I have Bass Lines by Bill Laswell. Bill Laswell is the producer behind artists like Herbie Hancock. He was all involved in um, uh, making Rocket. He's also produced bands like Motorhead, Iggy Pop. And he's also created incredible body of jazz rock albums where he brings in modern production methods, he mixes dub reggae ambient music with avant-garde free jazz, jazz fusion, and he uses a, a, a panoply of incredible musicians and he'll put weird musicians together. In the early 80s, he created his own solo album called Bass Lines, and this is a sort of cut up post My Life in the Bush of Ghosts mixed with a sort of prime time harmonic approach to jazz rock. It's a mind blowing album. And what I love about it is Bill Laswell's one of my favorite bass players and he plays the bass on here and he plays it in a sort of 
avant-garde free jazz wave. It's very virtuoso. It's an incredible album, incredibly produced. I think he did it on Electra Records, so it's like more of a normal album. It's not on one of his own labels. Um, it's a fantastic album. Um, if you like material, it's a bit like a material album that's bass heavy. Um, it's one of the great jazz rock albums of the 1980s. Um, at number 98, I have an album that's on this list because it represents an artist I felt that needs to be on this list. And also, it is one of the first jazz rock albums, which I think it was made in 1967. It is the album Duster by Gary Burton. An absolutely important, innovative jazz rock album. It's one of the first artistically successful jazz rock albums. Gary Burton brought his own, uh, own approach to um, mixing jazz with uh, popular music and rock music. Uh, and it was different to the style that um, got, gained a hold in the uh, 70s, like the Mavish Duxia, Weather Report, Post Bitches, Brew style of fusion. But, um, and when Pat Metheny emerges in the mid 70s with this other jazz rock sound, that really is going back to this original sound that we heard with musicians like Gary Burton, a very important uh, uh, musician in the history of jazz rock. At number 97, I've got Time in Place by Mike Stern. Mike Stern's one of my favourite guitarists. He uh, did possibly my, there's like, if you watch my favourite guitar solo list, he is the guitarist, I think on the guitar solo that came in number two, which is the guitar solo Fat Time off um, the album by Miles Davis, which is called The Man With The Horn. And uh, he then went on to make some incredibly important jazz rock albums in the 80s. And his style, which is sort of a bebop approach to jazz rock, has now sort of almost become the ubiquitous style. It, it comes out of the Brecker Brothers, but tracks like Chromosome, that's like everybody writes a track like that now when they're doing jazz rock. Um, I think the best album he did um, in the 1980s, you know, the important album was Time in Place, which is the album I've got at number 97. At number 96, I have Electric Guitarist. Electric Guitarist was John McLaughlin's return to electric guitar in the 1970s after he'd um, broken up the Mad Vision Orchestra and then gone off with the Shakti thing. And then I think perhaps the record companies were going, you know, you're not selling as much with this Shakti, you need to get back in there. So he comes back in with this sort of all-star um, album which features Carlos Santana, it features Chick Corea, Stanley Clark, Tony Williams, Billy Cobham, Jack DeJohnett, Tom Scott, no, not Tom, David Sanborn's on there. Um, uh, Patrice Russian's on there. Who else is on that album of notes? Um, Fernando Saunders, Carla Santana, what did I say before? Anyway, um, it's just chocked full of these incredible musicians on there. Uh, Jerry Goodman's on there um, with Nerada Michael Walden. So it's also a return to the sound of the Mavish Nocturne somewhat. He also um, returns to the sound of Mav Mavish Nocturne with a duet with Billy Cobham, uh, which is like a guitar drum duet. Um, he returns to play with Tony Williams' Lifetime and we see the sort of beginnings of what would become the trio of Doom, although it never really quite happened. But for me, the reason why this album's important is that I felt in the Mavish structure, which is his great statement on the electric guitar, what we hear is John's vision of the sound of the band. If you want to hear John McLaughlin playing electric guitar, this is the album to go to. The electric guitar playing is astonishing. And he does such a wide range of things on there, except play acoustic guitar. So that's what I've got at number 96. Um, is, uh, I've gone wrong now. I, I was doing really well. But looking at my list at number 95, I've got Bass Desires written down. Oh, it's gone wrong. So I am going to put into there... Before you have a go at me, because I want it on the list, and I knew it would be pretty low down, I am going to put it at number 95, Joyous Lake by Pat Martino. Pat Martino is one of the great um, jazz guitarists that, that emerged in the 1960s, who stuck much closer to acoustic jazz. In 1976 or 75, I'm not too sure, he then makes an album called Joyous Lake, where he really goes deeply into jazz fusion, and it's one of the great jazz fusion albums. 
And it's the one that popped up in my mind when I thought, who have I missed off this list this morning? I thought, oh, I should have put Joyce Lake on. So I've got it on because we've got that space. Then number 95, it's coming at, at number 94. I have Joe Zavanel's last album, 75, which is a double album that came out the year before he died or maybe even the year he did die and sees him joining back up with Wayne Short on a couple of tracks. But this album really just, for me, wraps up and personifies everything that Joe Zavanel represented in music. An absolute giant of 20th century music. And of course, when we think of Joe Zavanel, we want to go back to the Weather Report albums. But when Weather Report, when Weather Report broke up in 1986, he then went on to explore a whole range of different areas, going much deeper into sort of African music sounds, into vocal sounds, into sort of his sort of electronic fiesta carnival sound that he had, um, attracting incredible musicians around him. This is a monster album, 75 by Joe Zawinul. At number, and that's at night, number 94. At number 93, I have Vinnie Colliuta's first solo album, which is called Vinnie Colliuta. This was made in the early 90s, I think around about 94. It's a monumental jazz rock album. Uh, and he is pulling in such a wide range of, in, in, of um, styles, approaches. It's dark. Vinny's got a dark vision on this album. He pulls in stuff from sort of contemporary hip hop, especially sort of groups like, you know, uh, Diggable Planets, Blowout Comb, Michelle and Deke Chela, that heavy funkiness to it. There's an electronicness to it. There's a dubbiness to it. It's got an incredible range of musicians. It's virtuoso. It's got heavy metal bits in. It's absolutely incredible. But it's got, you know, for all these styles, and drummer solo albums often do, traverse a lot of different styles because that's why drummers think but on this it has a central dark vibe to it Vinny's gone on to make other solo albums since there's a few none of them compare to this this is a real masterpiece that's what we've got number 93 at number 92 I've put We Want Miles right with the aforementioned Mike Stern on guitar so Miles after his sort of disappearance from the scene in the late 70s where he went off to you know take lots of drugs and do all sorts of lots of weird stuff um, returns. He returns to the album Man With The Horn, which is a little bit weak. It has that incredible guitar solo by Mike Stern. But he is getting his health back, he's getting his playing back, and he brings out a live album of this incredible band that fe features Al Foster on uh, drums, um, Bill Evans on saxophone, uh, Mike Stern on guitar, Marcus Miller on bass. It's an incredible band. And this album is beautifully recorded. It's a warm, live album, and they really stretch out in a style which features that sort of slappiness of the Marcus Miller, the sort of, you know, bluesy sort of rock guitar sound of Mike Stern, but with the bebop licks. And it's the sound of 80s fusion. Miles has done it again. Perhaps more than he did with Bitches Brew. This is the sound. This is the sound you're going to hear on every single TV show in the 1980s. But what's great about this album is they really stretch out. And Mike Stern is mind-blowing. It's absolutely mind-blowing. In the early days, in the early 80s, you know, Mike Stern was off his head. He was blitzed out on drugs. He was not in a great place. And it gives his guitar playing a Larry approach that goes away once he sorts himself out and he becomes much more of a sort of controlled sort of post-bebop jazz rock guitarist. But Stern on this is unbelievable. You know, barely held in by uh, the Miles Davis. Absolutely incredible. And at 91, um, I have which is perhaps my favourite of the 1980s Miles Davis albums, which is Decoy of the studio albums. So they're the two albums I've put in for Miles in the 1980s, which needs to be represented. There's some incredible music there. Uh, Decoy is just beautifully produced. It's got an incredible sound. It's got some incredible playing from the likes of Branford Marsalis and John Schofield. It's just a mind-blowing album. We've got Daryl Jones on bass. It's it's just a brilliant, Decoy's a brilliant album. The next one after that, um, You're Under Arrest, he sort of goes more towards popular music styles. Really interesting album. And the, and the, but the sound's not quite like De Decoy's got a beautiful sound. Um, so that's what I've got at, um, where were we? We don't want to get lost. Could that happen before? Where are we? Number 91, Decoy. I don't feel like I've done anything terrible yet, have I? As we, as we get through the first 10. And so the last on the list is Quantum. At number 90, Quantum by Planet X. 
You've got to have a sort of that bit of proggy technical mental fusion. Planet X are the greatest at it. The incredible Virgil, Don Virgil Donati on drums. This is just virtuoso in your face um, jazz rock. There's tons of this around now. You know, this is the blueprint for bands like Animals as Leaders and Polyphia and all that stuff. Um, is it jazz rock? Are they really soloing or are these solos, you know, being worked out? I don't know, but I felt I need to represent that and I put that on the list at number 90. At number 89, I have an incredible, funky, genius Fusak album. And I know how I criticise Fusak, but when Fusak's done well, I absolutely love it, right? There is an album by a musician called Roland Vasquez. And he had a band called the Ur Urban Music Ensemble. And in 1979, I think, he made an album called The Music of Roland Vasquez. It's an absolute jazz fusion, jazz rock, funk, jazz, whatever you want to call it, masterpiece. It's brilliantly composed. It's brilliantly played. It's really funky, but it doesn't pander to commerciality. It's heavy. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's one of the albums I've discovered doing this channel. And when I spoke about it on my channel Roland Vasquez got in touch and emailed me which is an incredible thing um, so what have we got at number that's at number 89 number 88 we've got um, one of some contemporary jazz this is this is really verging on the jazz side of jazz fusion which is an incredible album it's called in the moment and it's by Micaiah McRaven uh, incredibly interesting innovative modern jazz musicians you know when i did my video this year's the, the year where i did my video i said all modern jazz musicians sound the same that was facetious and i was just critiquing it and i do listen to modern jazz players and a guy that i think is making music that doesn't sound like anything else is micaiah mccraven on this album he's obviously got into a jazz club they've recorded it really ambiently it's not been it's not been close mic'd and properly produced and then they've taken that away and they've dropped that into a computer and they've created loops you hear loops of, of groups with of, um, loop of the, oh God, come on Andy, you're going too fast. You hear loops of them playing, then you hear, you know, um, bits of improvisation. I don't know whether they're then soloing within the loops. And you hear these loops going around where you can hear the audience chatter becomes part of the sort of harmony of the tune. It's absolutely mind blowing and it seems to fuse very raw free jazz, uh, free ex, well, not free jazz, um, Jazz exploration with modern digital, you know, recording techniques is an absolute monumental album, and I put it at number eighty-eight. At number eighty-seven, I have the album um, "Lingua Franca" by Tram, which was introduced to me by Louis Dasser, who is one of the contributors to "Sea of Tranquility." And um, we both had to. Um, give each other an album to listen to. And uh, that was the one I think Louis know, knew um, my taste in music. And this album is basically a much more heavier jazz rock album, almost bordering on sort of all that common primetime jazz that has been created by the guitarist for Animals as Leaders. Um, I, I, I'm, and who was on drums? There's a, there's a modern drummer on there that's absolutely mind blowing. It's really incredible. But it has an openness and an improvisatory approach which you don't hear in those sort of technical metal bands. It's a really great album and I've put it on at number 87. You know, I bought it on CD. Uh, it's one of the few CDs I have bought this year and it was, it hasn't left the car. It's a really incredible album. Right. Um, at, Number 86, we have an album which is barely jazz rock, but I wanted to put them on the list because when they do do the jazz rock thing, it is absolutely infectious and wonderful and brilliant and it's forward-looking and exciting. And this is probably the most recent album on the list coming out just a few weeks ago, uh, just to show you that it's not all old stuff and it's the album Noah Forever by Noah. This is an album that's the band which is basically Louis Cole and Genevieve Tardy. They explore sort of modern popular music put through a sort of jazz fusion mill with lots of references to, you know, house music and uh, drum and bass. Uh, it features musicians like Mono Neon, Ray Thistlewaite, a whole bunch of really incredible players. And although this is an album of songs, so often when they get to the solo section, it's just burning jazz rock. When when's Louis Cole going to go in the studio with these players and just make a solid jazz rock album 
just where they just blow. They just get some grooves and blow. That's what I want to hear. And when he does that, because his take on jazz rock is so incredible. It's way past the Starkey Puppies and all those guys. It's incredible. And I want to hear that. And we see the glimpses on this album. This is a fantastic album, Noah Forever by Noah, which came out, I think, about a month ago. And I've put it high on the list at number, 90, uh, at, uh, number 86. Come on, Andy, you're stumbling a little bit, but you can do it. Number 85, I've got Modern Jazz Stories by Courtney Pine. Courtney Pine is one of the great British saxophone players. He was like the head of this sort of renaissance of British jazz musicians that merged in the 1980s and got so big that they were actually having mainstream chart success. They were on the TV all the time. And the poster boy, almost like the British Winter Marsalis, was Courtney Pine. But Courtney Pine's um, influence, which was a much wider, he pulled not only from sort of post Coltrane modal jazz, but he also pulled from sort of the big band tradition with jazz warriors he pulled from his sort of um west went west indian jamaican reggae roots he played in reggae bands before he's playing jazz groups and jazz rock um in nine i'd like to say 1996 i think this album came out modern jazz stories is like him playing in his most out and out post john coltrane way and guy god does he play He's circular breathing for hours on end through this tumultuous, chordal, spinning, you know, John Coltrane classic quartet type of jazz. But in the mix is a turntablist and there's loops and it's, it's sort of Coltrane. And I only, well, kind of, Courtney Pine's one of the few musicians who can do this, but it's like John Coltrane recorded now in a hip hop setting. It's absolutely incredible. Some of the music's so beautiful on there. They do a version of. Um, uh, Don't Explain, which is beautiful, with Cassandra Wilson, I think, sings that. Uh, but also there's some just ferocious, in, ferocious playing on here. Uh, Mom just thought it's number 85. At number 84, I have Massacre by Casper Broetzman. His dad, Peter Broetzman, I, I don't think he's on the list here, unless I've stuck the, stuck the last exit album. I might have done that, actually. I can't remember what put on here. But his son, Casper Broetzman, um, has a power trio, which takes the, the idea of the power trio to the outer limits. His greatest album is this one, Massacre. Uh, beautifully recorded. It's like, um, it's somewhere between Machine Gun by Jimi Hendrix and his dad, Peter Broetzman. It's an incredible album. Um, if you're into cream, right, if you're into cream and you love that sort of power trio ensemble sort of soloing, but you want to hear it taken to the outer limits, then get Massacre by Casper uh, Broetzen. I think that's the name of the band. Number 83, another 90s fusion classic for me, Show Me What You Can Do, which is a, a, a collaboration album with three incredible musicians, Frank Gambale, Stuart Hamm, and Steve Smith. Again, a power trio setting. Frank Gambale is one of the greatest guitarists that's ever lived, but often for me, his own music can get a little bit, not, not too much, but a little bit fusacky. Here, without a keyboard player, um, Gambale has to come in with all this chordal stuff that I've never heard before, and his playing is brutal. It's not the first time he's going to appear on here, Gambale. He's made the list quite a few times. Right. And number 82, an album that I received um, this year, sent to me by this legend, perhaps my favourite guitarist. Do you think it's John McLaughlin, don't you? My favourite guitarist, I don't think it is. If I, you had to push me, I just had to live in one guitarist. That guitarist would be the incredible, legendary, virtuoso Scott Henderson. Scott Henderson has everything for me. He can scream heavy metal guitar solos. He can play like Steve Ray Vaughan. He can play through giant steps. He's got the tone, if he wants, of Holdsworth, but he's got the tone, if he wants, of like the most dirty sort of Freddie King, Albert King, all the kings. It's all in there. He's got the whole thing in there. And he's made, made, been able to take that style and shift it through a, co a compositional approach, which is somewhere between Herbie Hancock, perhaps, and um, uh, Joe Sawinall, especially. But he's also got elements of, you know, Deep Purple and, you know, ZZ Top. There's all sorts of stuff in here. He's, he has been making albums recently where his style is now so developed. And um, 
I, I'll be interviewing Scott um, at some point, which is very, very exciting. And we've been chatting via email a little bit. And he sent me a number of his albums out, which I've had in the car. They're absolutely incredible. Incredible modern jazz fusion albums that do everything you want a jazz fusion album to do. And the album I've got with is um, at number 82, I have People Mover by Scott Henderson, right? At number 81, I think I have the only album on here that made the prog list and has made the fusion list. It sat, sits between the two of those styles. And it's by... Herman Zabel, and it's called Zabel, right? How many times have I told you about this guy? The, the um, piano prodigy son, uh, sorry, nephew. I'm still not gone wrong yet. I don't think I have anyway. Nephew of the great promoter Bill Graham. He was brought up in uh, Germany or Austria, can't quite remember. Some uh, Germanic country, and at the age of 16, 17, he arrives in New York. Through his contacts with his uncle, he ends up in a studio with Roberta Flack. He uh, plays the piano for her after telling her that he's the greatest pianist in the world. And lo and behold, he is at the age of 16, 17. So she goes out to Arista Records. He gets a major label deal. And he goes into the studio and makes this album, which is somewhere between oh, Coltrane, Frank Zappa, uh, bits of Herbie Hancock. It's really incredible, really dark, really intense, really complex. This album comes out because it's so uncompromised and it doesn't sell. And at that point, uh, Herman Zabel seems to have a nervous breakdown and disappears off the face of the earth. Uh, by the by, um, 2000s, his mother's registered him as a missing person. Although there are whispers and... Um, uh, theories that he is now living in Jerusalem in a cave. I have compressed this story down. I've done a number of videos on this. When I've discovered this artist, this album was relatively unknown, I think. Um, and I, on this channel, I've really discussed it. I just think it's one of the great albums of all time. Um, I even got in touch with the only surviving member on that album, which is the bass player, Michael Viseglia, who is the bass player with... Um, uh, the songwriter that wrote the incredible hit metal, Luca. And then they, <laughs> hey, I thought I was gonna get through with this. I'm not, I'm not. It's not gonna happen, Andy. It's not gonna happen, right? This is one of the most important songwriters of the 1980s, 1990s. And her name's Suzanne Vega, you see. I, didn't, I knew who she was. See, he's a bass player with Suzanne Vega, but he played bass on Herman Savelle's album. Oh, pretty close there, but I still think I'm doing all right. Not, this is this is better than the prog one, but how many we went to half an hour. <laughs> and where am I? I'm at number 81. This is going to be a long video. Do you want to go and get something to eat? <laughs> Pause it, go and get yourself something, go to the toilet. You know, tell your loved ones where you are. Right, so at number um, 80, we have the debut album from Steps Ahead which is called Steps Ahead. A wonderful album. I can't find it in my collection. I, I, I lost it. I'm not so keen on the later Steps Ahead. They get all big to 80s and programmed and all that type of stuff. They're great band live. But the first one, um, which I could well be called Steps. I couldn't look it up to find it anyway. It's a beautiful album. Peter Erskine on drums. Elena Leas on, on piano. Beautiful album. Uh, that's what I've got at... Um, number 80. At number 75, another weird album I thought I should put on here. I have got the, the, the grunge jazz rock album and it's by the drummer of Smashing Pumpkins, Jimmy Chamberlain, and it's called Life Begins. And it's an incredible album that although it has a few songs on it, also has some burning jazz rock album jazz rock tracks on there and I absolutely love it and you've got to go check it out. So that's why I've got number 79. At number 78, I've got Imaginary Day by Pat Metheny, an absolute masterpiece of the album. And this is one of those Pat Metheny albums where he has that great big epic scope to it. Um, it's just one of Pat's great albums. It's, it's, um, it's very representative of Pat Metheny. If you really want to hear what Pat Metheny is about, Check out Imaginary Day, brilliant album. And number 77, I've got Lunar Crush by Medeski and Dave Fazinski. Um, this is an incredible album. 
absolutely incredible. It was also for his features Jojo May and Gene Lake on drums. It's coming out of that sort of New York school of sort of very hip out there jazz rock. I've got a couple of albums on this list. Uh, Luna Crush is, is, is you know, Medetsky's organ works, who is obviously the keyboard player with Medetsky, Martin and Wood, uh, John Medetsky. Um, he, um, there's moments on here where he sort of be, seems to be channeling Tony Williams' lifetime, but it goes way beyond that. And there's some incredible stuff, including some incredible vocals on here. So that's what I've got, number 77, Luna Crush by Medetsky, John Medetsky and Dave Fizinski. At number 76, um, oh, we have an incredible album by a very unknown jazz rock album that operated in the 1990s, 2000s, and they are called The Lonely Bears. You know, I've just done my video where I've discussed musicians who died this year, and I discussed the great British jazz saxophone player, Tony Coe, who died this year at 88 years old. Tony Coe, which is known for playing much more straighter jazz, had this band which featured him on saxophone, Tony Hymus on keyboards, who's the keyboardist on um, Guitar Shop by Jeff Beck, Terry Bosey on drums, doing the full Terry Bosio thing, incredible, and Hugh Burns on guitar, who was the guitarist who played on Faith for um, George Michael. And that is the band and it's incredible album no bass player and if you like guitar shop imagine a much more out there fusion version of guitar shop that is what this is it's an incredible album and the lonely bears had a sound all of their own now even though they're quite obscure there is actually a, a, a video on youtube of them playing live go and check it out it's brilliant so at number 75 I have Dressing for Pleasure by John Hassel. John Hassel was a trumpet player, the American trumpet player that got uh, known for his association with Brian Eno. He used his trumpet in a way using effects, channeling the sound of Miles Davis. He goes even deeper into that sort of mournful, lonely Miles Davis sound. And by using effects, made many albums explored ambient electronic textures. Uh, in the early 90s, again, he made this album uh, called Dressing for Pleasure, which explores the world of hip hop put through a sort of post bitches brew sound world, and it's got people like Buckethead on it. Kenny Garrett comes on it, plays some incredible saxophone player playing. It's Luna Crush. Uh, sorry, I'm not on that. Uh, which one? Dressing for Pleasure by John Hassel is is perhaps one of his most fusiony albums, which fusion in its sort of hip hopness. Uh, it's the, it's a brilliant album, and uh, John Hassel's trumpet sounds incredible. Um, I really wanted to represent the great, late great Sean Lane on this list. Sean Lane's albums are fantastic, but they often suffer with not great production values. For me, the album that um, I always went to when I went to listen to Sean Lane was the album he made with Mike Shreem, the ex drummer of Santana. It also features Jonas Helberg on bass. It features Sean Lane's um, compositions. And on this album, it's beautifully recorded because Shreve, Mike, Mike Shreve brought in the production values to it. Two Doors, an incredible example of a great fusion guitarist, uh, Sean Lane, sadly departed us over 20 years ago now. It's quite, quite unbelievable. Um, at number 73, a monumental jazz rock guitar album, Truth in Shredding. Truth in Shredding, which features Alan Holdworth and Frank Gambale. And it takes your head off of their playing Brecker Brothers songs. It's just one of the great fusion albums of the last 30 years. It's absolutely in your face, mind blowing. At number 72, I've got Ronald Shannon Jackson, who came to a uh, sort of fame as a sort of har melodic free jazz jazz rock drummer with Ornette Cobb's prime time. In the 1980s, he hooked up with uh, Bill Laswell, making some incredible albums with his group, The Decoding Society. And the album, which is my favorite, is um, this one, which is called Taboo, and it features pre-Living Color, Vernon Reed just killing on free jazz noise guitar. Incredible stuff. All these albums are brilliant, obviously. At number 71, I have Ark of the Testimony. Ark of Test, the Ark of Testimony by Arcana. Arcana, again, was another jazz rock super group put together by Bill Laswell. It felt featured Buckethead on guitar, Ferris Saunders on saxophone, Tony Williams on drums. It's just incredible. This is one of the last really great jazz rock albums for me. This is like a masterpiece album. 
Ferris Sonnet is out. I'm, what am I going to say? If you haven't heard it, there's another Arcana album, which is a trio of Tony Williams, Derek Bailey and Bill Laswell on bass. That's a heavy going album, beautifully recorded. This one's full on jazz rock, space jazz rock, spiritual out there jazz rock. Incredible album, The Ark of Testimony by Arcana. At number 70, I have a live album by Trilock Gertu called Bad Habits Die Hard. This is incredible jazz rock. This is all, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm just saying it's all incredible. What's Tri Trilock Gertu is like the Indian percussionist that has a percussion center that sounds like a drum kit. He sits there cross legged even with his tablets. He's got a snare drum, a ride cymbal. He hasn't got a bass drum, but he seems to be able to cover it. And it sounds like incredible jazz rock playing. He brings a sort of polyrhythmical density to jazz rock in here. And, you know, and I think most people came to Trollope Goethe when he played with John McLaughlin in that trio alongside Kayette Cart and then later on Dominic P uh, de Piazza. But here, he, he, he expands out his approach into a heavy jazz rock style. And Trollope Goethe doesn't have to work in that style, but this is full-on jazz rock. There is incredible guitar playing from Dave Gilmore. Not the Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd, but the Dave Gilmore from the M bass bands. Incredible. It's got a touch of M bass on it as well, this app. But it's really just full on jazz rock. Right, at number 69, I have Electric Bath by Don Ellis. Don Ellis was a jazz trumpeter that emerged in the 1950s playing with Maynard Ferguson. In the 1960s, he started to come out of that free jazz um, third stream approach and started to bring in electronics. He started to bring in world music. He starts to bring in, um, in a big band, he starts to bring in all these different influences, modal playing, free playing, electronics, all this stuff's in there. And then in 1967, he starts bringing in pop and rock beats and he makes an album called Electric Bath. If I was gonna point out an album where jazz rock starts, it's not in a silent way, it's not Jack Johnson. I would point out Electric Bath by Don Ellis. Um, if you really want to find out more about Dunnis, I interviewed the late, great Ralph Humphrey in March, just a few weeks before he died, who was the drummer uh, with Don Ellis. Not on this album. He joined in on the one after it, which is, I think is called Shock Treatment, if my memory serves me right. Uh, but Ele Electric Bath is monumental. Go and check it out if you're a jazz rock fan. I've got number 68, another early jazz rock album by Jeremy Stieg, and it's called Energy which also features Don Elias on drums, Gene Perler on bass, and Jan Hammer on electric piano. This is an incredible early jazz rock album. It's made in 1970s, pre mavish Nuxture. It's incredible. It's so funky and dark, and uh, Jan Hammer just plays off the scale. Uh, Jeremy Stieg, for those of you who don't know, he's the guy playing the flute when the Pied Piper comes in on Shrek three which is bizarre enough and he plays a tune by the beastie boys um which is actually made out of a sample from jeremy steeg it's not off this album it's um often at the album before and i wish i could pull that out of my brain that's all quite bizarre that we got this 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 architect of jazz rock jeremy steeg playing on the soundtrack and actually miming in Shrek 3, how can this happen? The reason is because Jeremy Stieg's dad was the guy that came up with Shrek. So you get facts like this on these videos. Um, and number 67, a great 80s fusion album, Players, which features the Scott Henderson on guitar, Steve Smith on drums, T. Lavitz on keyboards, and Jeff Berlin on bass. I hope I've got that right. This is the trouble with doing this video. You really have to pull so much information. The only way you can do it is have it in your head. Uh, players is a great 80s jazz fusion. It does all the things you expect from 80s jazz fusion, but they really play. And uh, it features a very young Scott Henson. I love this late stage Scott Henson we have now. He's got all these blues licks. But back in the 80s, they had a much more liquid Holsworth sound, and I love that sound. It's a brilliant representation of Scott Henderson, who is one of my favorite guitarists, as I said earlier. At number 66, I have Eyewitness by Steve Carr, which is a live album that came out. It fe features Steve Jordan on drums. It features on bass, Anthony Jackson. It's a power trio. It's like jazz rock in influenced by the police. It's a great album. Steve Carr is a fantastic jazz rock guitarist. His album's a little bit fusaki for me, but this isn't. It's live and it's exploratory. It's absolutely brilliant. At number 65, I have Zawinul 
by Joe Zawinul, his solo album from 1971, pre-Weather Report. And I think it's better than the early Weather Report albums. It features Jack DeJohnette on drums, Herbie Hancock's also on piers on keyboards. It's dark and interesting. It's got soundscapey stuff on. It's very post bitches Brew uh, um, jazz, jazz rock. And I think it's probably the greatest um, example of that bitches brew sound in terms of the way the, the actual ensembles play. Joe Zamel was so important to the sound of In and Silent Way and Bitches Brew. And here we see him realising it. Where the report starts off a lot more collaboratively and Zawinul's vision is, is pared down with, especially not just with Wayne Shorter, but with all the musicians in the early weather report. And then Zawinul slowly takes more and more control of the band. With this solo album, he has a vision. He has a vision for electric jazz, which is incredible. At number 64, I have a very obscure album, one of my favorite albums of us all time. It's called Red Twist and Tune Arrow. It's on ECM Records and it's a collaboration between Christy Duran, Freddie Studer and Stephen Whitwer. Christy Duran and Stephen Whitwer, or Stephen Whitwer, sorry, are guitar players. Freddie Studer was a great uh, jazz drummer, jazz rock drummer who died sadly last year. Um, this is two guitars and drums. Go and listen to it. It's on ECM Records. It's mine. It doesn't sound like an ECM record. This is really weird, Zappa-esque, free jazz, angular, you know, and the way the guitars work together, the way the drums work, it's hyper intricately composed. And the soloing is incredible. It's just incredible album. Number 64, Red Twist and Tuned Arrow. And number 63, we have Extensions by David Holland. Not by Manhattan Transfer. I love that album, but it never made the list. It's one of my favourite albums. It didn't quite make the list. I don't know whether we could class that as a jazz rock album. Now, this is Extensions by David Holland. David Holland, one of the great British jazz musicians who came up the same time as John McLaughlin in that London scene. He gets picked up by Miles Davis a little bit before John McLaughlin. He gets, goes out there and becomes one of the most important bass players in the history of jazz, making Dave Holland one of the most important British jazz musicians. He did some incredible albums, really explaining much more ideas coming from free jazz. His album with um, Anthony Braxton and Sam Rivers' Conference with the Birds is an absolute classic, but we wouldn't say it's a jazz rock classic. In the 80s, he returns with a quintet which Steve, features Steve Coleman of a sort of M bass fame. And there's M bass ideas and there's a funkiness and a fusioniness to this. And with this album, it's also joined by Kevin Eubanks, who's one of the great uh, jazz rock guitarists of recent times, which doesn't get, he doesn't get talked about so much now. He is on fire on this album. Extensions is in your face jazz rock fusion. Brilliant. Right, what are we, where are we? Don't get lost. Extensions. At number 62, we have Melodies by Jan Hammer. Melodies of the album made by the Jan Hammer group after he left the Mavish Doctor. He made a, a trio of albums, um, and I've really tried not to put too many Jan Hammer. I could just fill it with, I, you know how much I love Jan Hammer. Melodies is the one where they started to write songs, and you would say, well, is there a jazz rock album? Yeah, it's full of it's some incredible soloings, in some incredible production, incredible keyboard playing. Stephen Kindler on violin, Fernando Saunders on bass, Tony Smith on drums. It's monumental. Melody is one of the greatest albums ever made. It only is low on this list because um, it's not really a jazz rock album. It's just got. It's, it's like Noah. It's like the Noah album. But go and check it out. You got to have it. You got to have it in your in your collection if you're a jazz rock fan. At number sixty one is there Iron Path by Last Exit. I spoke about Last Exit uh, before. Or did I? Oh, I mentioned I mentioned Peter Broetsman when I talked about Massacre and his son, Casper Broetsman. Uh, so Peter Broetsman was a free jazz um, musician, um, probably most well known for making Machine Gun, which came out in 1968, and it's just like probably the most out there album ever made. Um, in the 1980s, he formed a supergroup with Bill Laswell on bass, Ronald Shannon Jackson on drums, and Sonny Sharrock on guitar, and they made some incredibly in your face. What's the word? Coruscating. Can I use that word? Is that a word? Coruscating. The coruscating sound of Last Exit on those live albums that came out. Cassette recordings and all that sort of stuff. Incredible stuff. 
he, Laswell took him into the studio um, and made an album incredibly pleased called Iron Path. At the time, when I was listening to Last Exit, because it was just the sort of nether regions of music, just to have your face taken off by that sound, I was a little bit let down by Iron Path. But as time has gone on, I've started to realise what absolute jazz rock masterpiece it is. And that's the thing, it's a jazz rock album. It's, and it's got a brooding darkness, and at, at points they're playing full out. But there's other points where it's apt, very beautiful and controlled. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, an album well worth checking out. Ignore the reputation of this band and go and check out Iron Path. At number 60, I've got Blue Matter by John Schofield. What can I say? John Schofield played the Miles Davis group. Before that, he was in Billy, Billy Collins' band. He then goes solo in the 1980s. And he slowly starts to form his own sound, which is a sort of mixture of sort of Ornette Colbert star player with sort of New Orleans funk sound. And in places, a quite driving jazz rock sound, which seems to pull out in all the contemporary sounds um, from around him in the 80s at that time. And he does it well. Um, the album... Um, Electric Outlet, you start to hear that funky sound on there. It's a bit overproduced. Then we have Still Warm with Emma Hakim on drums, Daryl Jones on bass. That's a great album. It's a masterpiece for that one. He finds his sound and then he puts this band together with Dennis Chambers on drums, Gary, Jam uh, Gary Granger on bass and, and a, a variety keyboardist. can't remember. Um, might be Jim Beard. I can't remember. Anyway, um, and he makes this album, Blue Matter. This is one of the most important jazz rock albums of the 1980s. It's one of the most successful ones, and it's incredible. And it brings, launches Dennis Chambers onto the world, which has become sort of the ubiquitous approach to playing jazz fusion. At number 59, I have the debut album by Naked City called Naked City. Naked City was John Zord's um, group put together, uh, which features Fred Frith on bass, it features Bill Frizzell on guitar, and it features Joey Bauer on drums. And here John Zorn explores a type of jazz fusion which takes in sort of film soundtracks, deathcore metal, free jazz, and sort of postmodern kitsch approaches. Um, all the Naked City albums are great. Um, I think the one that represents them the best is this first album, which is what I got on the list. At number 58, I've got Rhythm People by Steve Coleman. Um, I nearly put um, Dow of Mad Fat on, which is the live album, which I always sort of put forward as the great M bass album. The album I discovered in one was this studio album, uh, which is called Rhythm People. And it's a brilliant example of Steve Coleman at his peak. M bass is a style of music which took sort of Olnet Coleman style soloing, it mixed that with sort of James Brown funk, hip hop. And a sort of numeric, esoteric numeric approach to song and music structure, in, in, and it's 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 a sound which we now hear, really all the time in modern jazz groups. But the M bass sound is not that well known. If you want to check it out, go and check out Rhythm People by Steve Coleman, which I've got number fifty eight, number fifty seven. I've got Two Drink Minimum by Wayne Krantz, one of the great modern jazz rock guitarists, um, who in the in the late 90s went into some jazz clubs stuck up a mini disc recorder and stereo mic and recorded this gig it sounds incredible they're playing incredible it has a, a sound of a band not really where they're being recorded and just playing and Wayne Kratz has a brilliant approach to jazz rock where it's very improvised but you sort of cyclical triggered um, cued um, passages and I think he developed this because he just didn't have the budgets to rehearse a band. So he came up with this way of playing, which is incredible. Zach Danzig is on drums on this and the drumming's unbelievable. And I believe he is exploring a way of drumming, which has also become, we hear it in the people like Keith Carlock, we hear it in like Louis Cole, there's a certain approach on this album, it's the first time I ever heard it. It's a sort of overflowing, bullient, um, uh, dancey way of playing jazz, but with the ability to bend. I'm talking too much, aren't I? We're coming up to a, an hour. And where am I? God, Andy, I'm not halfway. It's going to be two hours. Right, so that's what I got at number 57 is two drink mini minimum. At number 56, I've got the album 1995 by The Screaming Headless torsos which is the band put together with Dave Fuzinski on guitar 
Um, who else is in that band? Gene, Gene Lake's on drums. It's that New York set of musicians that sort of ended up backing up Michelle and Degachela. This album is out there with some incredible vocals. It's quite catchy, but it's extreme and avant-garde, and it pulls in bits from sort of heavy metal, you know, bits from hip-hop, avant-garde jazz. Really great stuff. And I'm going to go faster now. So that's what I've got, number 56, 1995, by Screaming Headless Torsos. At number 55, I have the monumental Escalator Over the Hill by Carla Blair, the triple album which uh, features everyone from Linda Ronstadt for Don Cherry. It's a, it's a jazz rock, free jazz opera over three discs. And in the middle of it, it has a band which features John McLaughlin on guitar, Paul Motion on drums, Jack Bruce on bass, and Carla Blay on, on the organ. And this is the beginnings of jazz rock. In, in, in this incredible album that does all this, you hear the beginnings of jazz rock as well. It's, it's incredibly realised, it's an absolutely monumental album and it should be as legendary as Trap Rask, Mask Replica or Bitches Brew or any of all Love Supreme, all these albums that get trotted out, it should be up there, it's, it's, greater, than, it's greater than Trap Mask Replica, I don't care what anyone says. Number 55, Escalator Over the Hill by Carla Blake. And number 54, I knew I would get told off if I didn't have this band on the list, so I've put them on the list for you. It's the Dixie Dregs. I've never really listened to that much Dixie Dregs and I really like them and I've got nothing against them. It's just a band I missed out on and I need to educate myself. So I did a little bit and I went through all their albums, had a quick listen and I've decided, and I might have got this wrong Dregs fans, I might have got it wrong, but I've gone, I've decided to go for Dregs of the Earth by Dixie Dregs, which was recorded around about 78, 79. Incredible album. Um, it's like a Dixie Dregs, it's like Somewhere between ZZ Top and the Mavish Norkstra. Oh, that should be the best band in the world. <laughs> Why don't I listen to this band? <laughs> you have fallen, Andy. You've missed out. I missed out on the Dixie Dregs. I'm going to have to do a video on them. But I'm going to have to find a way when I know really know little about them. I love them. I love Rod Morgenstein's drumming. I love... Um, Steve Morse, incredible alternate picking guitar. It's a real genius. I love the way they've got the violin in there. They do everything I should like. I just missed out on them. And I heard Dixie Dregs when I was a kid because they they provided the theme to the Friday Night Rock Show here in the UK which, where they played all the new wave and British heavy metal. So I heard that from day one. And I never bothered to do the research. I love that track. That's all I know. <laughs> Number 53, that's all you're going to get for Dixie Jags. Oh my God, this is going to take hours. And number 53, we have Gaziers by Gong. You know, this is the second incarnation of Gong, the jazz rock fusion version of Gong, which was fronted by Pierre Morlan. This album features Alan Holdsworth on guitar. It's a sort of percussion heavy, you know, French version of Weather Report. And it's just one of the greatest jazz rock albums ever made. I don't care what anyone says. Gazias is one of the greatest jazz rock albums ever made. It's just brilliant. I absolutely love it. At number 52, we have the incredible European guitarist who has his own sound. I don't talk about it enough on this channel. Who, who seems to channel sort of Hank Marvin mixed with Jimi Hendrix, mixed with a sort of cold, cold sort of um, Scandinavian sound of the fjords. It is, of course, the guitarist to Hey Ripdal. And I have put on this a, a different album. You know, my favourite album is The Mountain That Sings. I love that album. That's always been one of the album I listened to a lot when I was... Um, Younger, it's quite it's a later album by Behave to Hey Rip That, but I think the 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 obvious jazz rock ones because some of them veer much towards the spacey jazz, but the, the the sort of most jazz rocky of them is Odyssey. That's to Hey Rip That. That's what I've got at number fifty two. At number fifty one and number fifty, I have two albums by Santana. At number fifty one, I have Lotus, which is the triple live album that he made in his jazz rock period and at number 50 I have Caravanserai. This is sort of Santana with that sort of Latin rock meets Bitches Brew. Incredible stuff. At number 49 I have Of Human Feelings by Ornette Coleman's Primetime. 
Prime Time are one of the most important jazz rock groups in the history of jazz rock. Um, Ornett Coleman started to experiment with funk and rock in the mid 70s with Dancing in Your Head and he made a, a row of incredible albums. I've been listening to Virgin Beauty, which is a sort of late 80s album in the car this week, and that's incredible. I've got Jerry Garcia on guitar. But the, the, the real masterpiece for me is of Human Feelings, which sounds like a berserk James Brown. Two, two James Brown bands playing at the same time. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. It's funky, it's out there. The bass playing in this band is unbelievable. You've got Jamalind and Ta Takuma, I think Calvin West, they're just months. The bass playing is incredible on these albums. Harmelodic virtuoso bass playing. That's what the world needs more of, isn't it? At number 48, I have an album by the band created by Bill Laswell, and it's the album Hallucination Engine. This is a jazz rock classic. It features Wayne Shorter on saxophone on some of the tracks. They revisit Weather Report tracks. He does sort of a remix of Cucumber Slumber on here. They, they mix William Brothers with Billy Colburn, and it's just out there fusion. Very dark, very ambient, very dubby, but it's fusion without a doubt. Number 47, Scott Henderson appears again with his incredible band Tribal Tech, which waved the flag for vicious, brutal jazz rock in the 1980s. The album I've got is Illicit. There could be a million of these albums. I've gone with Illicit. It's heavy, it's out there, it's brutal, incredible. Number 46, another very important um, 80s jazz rock album. I've got the debut album by Chick Corea's Electric Band, which also features Scott Anderson on guitar. It's also got Carlos Rios on guitar. And this is where we first heard Dave Weckl, first heard John Patitucci. And when Chick Corea came out, after doing quite a lot of esoteric albums on ECM, he came out in 1986 with this album. It just blew us all away. And that was the sound of 80s jazz rock, wasn't it? It was the Chick Corea Electric Band. Um, at number 44, I've got Secrets by Alan Holdsworth. What can I say about this? this all of the Alan, Alan Holdsworth albums are incredible, but this is the album that he has Vinnie Colliuto on drums, and Vinnie seems to just have a, a sort of empathy with Alan Holdsworth, and they only ever really did this album together. He does crop up on Woodcliffe Tower on one track, and again, it's, it, it's, um, it's a sound which is just... The only place you can find it is on Secrets. That opening track, City Nights, is perhaps the greatest drumming and the greatest guitar playing <laughs> ever. And all at the same time. Um, with the incredible composition of Gary Husband, another incredible drummer. Right, where are we? At number 43, I have the debut album from Jack... Jacko Pastorius, called Jacko Pastorius. This is a real album that just goes right. I'm Jacko Pastorius, I'm the greatest bass player in the world. Here you go, Donna Lee, where he plays Charlie Parker things on the bass. And then you get that Sam and Dave track, which is so funky and shows his soulful roots with Donna Michael Walden on drums. You got stuff like Portrait of Tracy, which just re. Um, just. <sighs> renegotiates the way a bass sounds. There's. Um, um, out there playing, it flows, it flies. It's just an incredible album. Uh, this um, and uh, what was the follow up to that? This is I've been doing this for too long. I my brain start to um, word of mouth. That's an incredible album too, and I nearly had them both on the list. Uh, so at um, at number forty three, we have Jacko Pastorius, a dev album by him called Jacko Pastorius. And word of mouth. Right. So. Um, What's next? Number 42, Unorthodox Behaviour by Brandex. I love all the Brandex albums. My favourite album is Moroccan Roll, but I think the consensus is their great album was the first album, which is Unorthodox Behaviour. This features Phil Collins on drums, just playing his ass off. Ass off. That's what we get from Phil on that album. Percy Jones on bass with that also incredible signature fretless sound. It's an incredible album. At number 41, I've got an album which is verging towards progressive rock, but it's a jazz rock album. It's One of a Kind by Bill Bruford. A beautiful album, incredibly realised, um, controlled with a just mountain of virtuosity. Again, Alan Holdsworth just playing 
Incredible stuff. Um, one of the great prog albums of the 1970s and one of the great um, jazz rock albums of the 1970s, Bill Bruford, one of a kind. At number 40 I have I Heard the Blues, She Heard My Cry by George Duke, my favourite George Duke album. This, he does everything. It's funky, he goes down a zapper route, there's comedy sections, there's out and out jazz rock sections, there's pastiches where he sounds like he's having a barbecue out the back of his house with Johnny Guitar Watson. It's just a brilliant, entertaining, fantastic jazz rock album which features um, incredible... Um, Contributions from Ndugo on drums, we've got Daryl Stoom on guitar, Lee Rittner's on guitars on there as well, Flora Purim and I to um, appear at one point. It's a really great album. Um, it's like George Duke in the 70s is somewhere between Parliament Fungadelic and Frank Zappa. And he does that on this album. Number 39, I have Enigmatic Ocean by John Luc Ponty. All the late 70s John Luc Ponty's albums are incredible. Imaginary Boys, Aurora, all these are incredible albums. We have to pick one. The reason why we go for this one again, because it's got Alan Holdsworth on it, again with Daryl Stumer. Who was, <laughs> I've just mentioned them both. And uh, that just lifts it up slightly. In the, it's, it's, it's Ponty at his peak. At uh, number 38, I've got the Grand Wazoo by Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa, we could really fill up this list with albums. I've had to be very, you know, sensitive in just pulling a few Zappa albums out. And these are very important Zappa albums. Of course, in the early 70s, he got pushed off that um, uh, stage in the rainbow by some weird fan. He broke his uh, pelvis and was stuck in a wheelchair so he decided to write big band jazz rock music and he made two incredible albums, Wacka Joe Wacka which really sort of explores a more of a bitches Bruce sound and then The Grand Wazoo which is probably the slightly greater of these albums. It's a monumental album. Again it's got George Duke on keyboards. It's one of the great jazz rock albums. It's in the tradition of Don Ellis. It's in the tradition of you know Gil Evans in a way. Uh, brilliant album. And um, I've got another Zappa album at number 37, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, which for me renegotiates the way you improvise in a jazz rock setting. It renegotiates it. And the way Zappa relates to Vinnie Colliute on drums on that album was a textbook for me. It, it was just... Um, my approach to playing jazz rock in an improvisational setting came from that, hearing that. It's mind-blowing. Zappa plays just a, a triple album of guitar solos and being the compositional geniuses, he holds his in, your interest all the way through with some of the most out there weird guitar playing anyone's ever done. At number 36, I've got Heavy Metal Bebop by the Brecker Brothers. All the Brecker Brothers albums are fantastic. They're jazz rock classics. We could have had any of them. Although they do suffer by having a bit of singing on every now and then, especially when Randy Brecker decides to sing. I'm, I, I, I don't know what to make of that. But uh, they did a live album, and it featured Terry Bozzi on drums. And Terry Bozzi, for me, just gave the Brecker Brothers a little bit of a kick up the arse out of that sort of fuse act funky sound they normally have. And it's driving, and he pushes them. Brecker's on electric sax, you know, Leary Con or whatever it is. Uh, Randy Brecker's got all this, the effects on. And the one song that they do do which is called East River, is just an absolute funky pop rock classic. So that's what I've got at number 36. At number 35, I have got Exhibit by John Serry Jr. This is like a cross between Frank Zappa and the most commercial disco Fusak album. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's one of the greatest jazz rock albums ever made. Um, I discovered it doing this channel. It was mentioned to me by so many people. I sat down and listened to it. It was unbelievable. The follow-up he did as well, Jazz Is, is also unbelievable. But the one I'm going to go for is Exhibit, because it just has that tighter Fusak 70s production, which I actually really like, where there's like tons of gaffer tape on the drums and everything's dry. Sounds wonderful. So where am I? I've, I've scrolled down. This is where I get lost. So at number 34, Venusian Summer by Lenny White. Right? For me, I love Return to Forever. And I love all the solo albums. I love Aldi Mola's albums. I love um, Stanley Clark's solo albums. But for me, the peak 
of the sort of return to forever world is Venusian Summer by Lenny White. It's probably because I'm a drummer. But when I was a kid listening to this, it just did everything. It's got funky tracks on there. It's got weird electronica on there. And it's got brutal jazz rock. Side 2 is just brutal jazz rock. The mating jive with incredible Ray Gomez just burning our guitar. Ray Gomez is one of the great jazz rock guitarists of the 1970s, the 1980s. You know, and in the 1980s, Neurotic Michael Walden got him played on all these massive hit records. He played for Shaka Khan, all these incredible people. But in the 70s, Ray Gomez was burning. He's one of the burning guitarists. You've got John McLaughlin, you've got Bill Connors, maybe Larry Coriel at certain points, and Ray Gomez, he just burns. He burns on this album. And then the next track, which is this great big epic jazz rock track, which is called The Princess of the Sea or The Prince of the Sea, can't remember. Aldi Miola and Larry Coriel dueling with each other. This is incredible. It's one of the greatest jazz records, beautifully recorded. Lenny White's off the scale. That's why I got number 34. At number 33, we're now going to be getting through sort of the, the, um, the sort of Return to Forever solo albums. They've all got to be represented. So at number 33, I've got The Leprechaun by Chick Corea. A strange album, a twee album, a concept album that explores over... over Two sides, the world of the fairy folk. It really does. And it's twee and twiddly. And it should be terrible, but it's not. It's incredible. And I think it's got some of the greatest ensemble jazz rock playing ever. Uh, tracks like um, um, Lenore and Night Sprite. It's Steve Gadd on drums. He just is all over the place. And, 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 and Chicks is his sort of keyboard Rick Wakeman overdubbing you know peak on this album one of my favorite albums number 32 I have got school days by Stanley Clark could have been journey to love as well didn't know which one to put on I thought I can't put loads of Stanley Clark albums well because school days is I think just because it's got that riff hasn't it and that incredible Ray Gomez guitar solo Ray if you're watching because I know Rock, I don't know if Ray watches this channel but we do share we do chat now I've sort of made contact with Ray and I'm going to I'm going to interview him at some point because I think he's one of the great jazz rock guitarists. And God, he did the guitar so on School Days. Incredible album. Um, at number 31, I have got Stanley Clark, the, the uh, second solo album by Stanley Clark, which, it, which contains one of the greatest jazz rock groups of all time. And they only appeared on this album. That's Stanley Clark on bass, Bill Connors on guitar, um, Tony Williams on drums and Jan Hammer on keyboards and they just play. It's like that period of jazz rock where it was still psychedelic and out there and they just play and it's all over the place. Um, I love that album so much. And number 30, I have got Believe It by Tony Williams' Lifetime. Um, Tony w Williams, after sort of being so important in the history of jazz rock with his band the Tony Williams Lifetime with John McLaughlin on guitar and Larry Young on keyboards and then eventually Jack Bruce on bass. He sort of loses his way when he should have really been at the forefront of jazz rock. Uh, but in 1976 he pulls it together and again, it's a little bit when he, like when he met John McLaughlin with the original Tony Williams Lifetime. He, he meets Alan Holdsworth, he brings Alan Holdsworth over in the same way as he brought John McLaughlin over in like five years or four years, six years before. He brings Alan Holdsworth over from the UK to America and plonks him in this band and makes this album believe it. And it's one of the greatest jazz rock albums of all time. I love this album because it just sounds like the band in the room playing. And Holdsworth is just going, here I am, the greatest guitarist in the world, America. <laughs> it's incredible. So um, at number 29, I have, um, I have Timeless by John Abercrombie, which is... Um, also explores the organ trio in much the same way that um, Tony Williams' Lifetime explored the organ trio. We've got Jan Hammer on organ, Jack DeJohnette on drums, and John Abercrombie. It's an incredible album. Um, it's jazz rock, but it's like its own, it's its own style or school of jazz rock. So my phone's ringing up. You know, my phone always rings. I put it on silent for this one because I didn't want to get put off. And they're just not going away. Look, 
Oh, this, I know who this is. This is somebody trying to talk to me about my mobile phone bloody contracts. I keep telling them to take them me off the list and they won't. Right, so I've publicly shamed them. Tesco Mobile, leave me alone. It's not Tesco Mobile, Tesco Mobile is owned by somebody. Like if you get off on this tangent, we're at one hour and, uh, and 10 minutes here. Right, <clears throat> go faster. Where are we now? Number 28, where have I known you before? The second album by The Electric Returns Forever. The first album that Aldi Mail appears on, absolutely incredible. Number 27, I've got Expectations by Keith Jarrett. Keith Jarrett, does he make jazz rock albums? Yes, he does. He makes jazz rock, it might be all acoustic, but he's got an electric guitarist on this album. And he's got that sort of gospel -y jazz rock sound. A great album made by the American Quartet. Brilliant. At number 26, I've got Bright Size Life by Pat Metheny. So Pat Metheny's debut album, Jaco Pastor is on bass, Bon Moses is on drums, a power trio. Re, it really basically moves jazz rock out of that sort of mavish new world, out of that sort of funky world. And he becomes the next great sort of architect of the jazz rock sound on that album. At number 25, I've got Oh Yeah by Jan Hammer, which is um, just mind blow jazz rock. If you like the Mavish Nostra, then you'll love this. Jan Hammer is off the scale. Magical Dog, incredible. Incredible album. Don't know what I can say. Oh Yeah. At number 24, I've got Blow by Blow by Jeff Beck. It's his first foray into jazz rock. It's funky, it's incredible, it's a brilliant album where, where you can really hear the joy of Jeff Beck being able to really play the guitar. You know, it's got um, um, inputs from Stevie Wonder, although he kept that quiet. Stevie Wonder's writing stuff there, and I think he's playing on some of it at some point. Um, really getting scatterbrain that's an incredible tune where you can hear him really trying to do Jeff Beck's version of the Mavish Nocture. Absolutely incredible. But not quite as good as the one I got at number 23, which is Wired by Jeff Beck, which features Jan Hammer on keyboards and Narada Michael Walden on drums. Um, it's got my favourite drumming of all time on, on the track Sophie Play With Me and Lead Boots. That's just the greatest drumming by Narada Michael Walden. Right, at number 22, I have Elegant Gypsy by Aldi Miola. This is when he, it's his second solo album, he's left the Re Return Forever, and he forges this, this sound which takes the Return Forever sound, but channels it much down, more down a sort of Latin stroke, heavy metal approach. This is the album that really is the forerunner of the, all that shred master stuff that happens in the 80s. He made it in 1977, it's a mind-blowing album. Um, massive seller, one of the biggest selling jazz albums of all time. At number 21, I've got Thrust by Herbie Hancock. Right, Palm Grease. What a track. This is as funky as jazz rock ever got. Herbie Hancock brought the funk in and this Thrust is funky. Absolutely incredible. I'm going to go a bit faster now. <laughs> At uh, number um, 20... I have Hymn to the Seventh Galaxy by Return to Forever. This is the first, it's got Bill Connors on the guitar, the only one with Bill Connors. And Bill Connors is different to Ali Mayer, he's much more hysterical and out of control. It's almost screaming Hendrix stuff, like, you know, it's really channeling the Mavish Nostra. This album's raw and dirty and live and in your face. It's the most brutal album by um, Return to Forever, and it's the closest that Chick Corea ever got to heavy metal. So I've got a number 20, it's one of the, these are all classic albums. I mean, Oh my God, I've got a double up here again. At number um, <laughs> 19, I have got Sextant by Herbie Hancock. Sextant was the last of the Mawandishi albums. He uh, moved over to, I think, Columbia Records at that point. Um, and um, it's his sort of post Bitches Brew electric jazz, but with a funkiness. It's an incredible album really somewhere between the Marandeshi sort of exploratory jazz style and then the Headhunters type jazz funk style. That's what I've got at number 19. At number 18, I have a big space because I've made a mistake when I was, I've been copy and pasting stuff all over the place. And when, when I was coming up then earlier on, there was an album I became aware was not on this list. I thought, oh my God, I've missed that off the list. And what was that album? And I might have to put it in here. 
this risk list is rubbish, isn't it? Because I've had two spots where, after so much consideration of getting this right, this happens. I don't know. So what I'm going to do is, let's have a look. I'm going to have to make this up on the spot by having a look. So what we've got, we've got that there. Oh, hang on. No, that's all right. That one's on the list. We've got that one coming up. We're getting, we're getting closer, closer to number one, but I've just got to get something that go into that 18 slot. And I think it should be I think I know what it should be. Oh my God, I know what's missing. I think I know what's missing from that space. I think what should have gone in there was between nothingness and eternity by the Mavish Nocturne. Yeah, that was supposed to be in there, which is the live album. It's pretty, it's quite low on the list. We've got it coming in at number 18. Um, it is one of the greatest jazz rock albums. Um, I think it's only lower down because we've got the other Mavish Orchestra albums above it. Um, and that's about it, really. I think I had that there. And this doesn't seem quite right, but there's a trouble with these lists. But looking at what's above it, I, 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 right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to, I've, I've got the structure of this, right. So what I've got, at number 18 is introducing the 11th house by the 11th house which is the debut album by the 11th house which was larry Coriol's take on that sort of heavy mavish nocturne style it's a brilliant album Alpha, alphonse moves on on drums is off the scale we've got randy brecker on trumpet right so that's what i've got at number 18 at um Number 17, I've got the album Level 1 by The 11th House, which I think just zips it. It's tighter, more control, and even more brutal in a way. Um, so that's what I've got at number 17. At number 16, I have Crosswinds by Billy Cobham. Billy Cobham, you know, he comes out in 1973 with Spectrum. It's one of the greatest jazz rock albums ever made. And then he forms this band, which is basically a reiteration of Dreams, which he had before with the Brecker Brothers on sax. He's got George Duke on keyboards. And he makes this album, Crosswinds. It's the album that introduced me to jazz rock. It's the album that introduced me to Billy Cobham right back in the early days. The first jazz rock, proper jazz rock album I ever bought. And I worshipped it and listened to it over and over again. It's, um, it's, it's mellower in a way than Spectrum because it's got this sort of big ensemble sound with the brass but it's ferocious at the same time and it's it's it, it, it does explore the weather it's called Crosswinds and it has this weather sound to it I don't know if it's because I've been listening to it since I was like 13 years old or whatever but it, that's the thing to me you can hear the wind in this album um, so that's what we've got at number 16 so at number 15 i now have in the right place between nothingness and eternity the live album and the last album by the classic mavish nocturne billy cobham jerry goodman rick laird jan hammer that's what we've got there recorded live and now reissued with another disc of um, other tunes and if you put those two discs together that could well be the greatest album by the mavish nocturne i always Felt a little bit let down by this album when I was younger because I thought the mix was a bit muddy. Well, the, my vinyl version was. But listening to it remastered now, you hear them at their most brutal. And Dreams, which is like 20 minute long epic, is probably the Mavish Nocturne at its most grandiose and out there incredible. So, what have we got at number 14 that is greater than Between Us and the Eternity? I have got In A Silent Way by Miles Davis. For many people, this is where jazz rock starts. I don't think it does, but it's a very, very important album. It really does mark that point where Miles Davis has made a full move over to electric jazz. I would call it as electric jazz, but it is the debut to the world of John McLaughlin. And what John does on that sets the seal for everything that's going to happen after that. Um, so that's what I got number 40, In A Silent Way. Of course... A couple of years later, I think just a year later, in fact, um, Miles Davis um, 
pulls John McLaughlin back into the studio and he sits him in a room. And this, this is not his normal band. He's got a live band that, at that time with Dave Holland, Chick Corea, you know, that's Tory. But he puts, puts his special band together for a session for film track soundtrack about the boxer Jack Johnson, right? Um, those um, musicians in that room are Michael Henderson, who is a, is a, a soul, rhythm and blues bass player, very funky. We've got Billy Cobham on drums, we've got John McLaughlin on guitar. This is the first time you have Billy Cobb and John McLaughlin go together. This is like electricity, right? And uh, what everyone always talks about is the opening shuffle, you know, and the story goes that, you know, Miles told them not to play, I don't want you to play, I don't want you to play, and that tension just overflows into this shuffle, right? Um, and uh, Miles then tells him to hit record and he goes in and he starts to play the trumpet and he tells John to change the key. He tells Michael Henson to change the key. John picks up of it because he's like that jazz virtual. He changes key and Michael Henson doesn't. For a while, you have them playing in two keys at the same time and Miles just, with his note source, traverses through the middle of it. And this here is often cited as being at the beginnings of jazz rock. But on the same session... John McLaughlin actually starts on another session, actually take 12, if you go back to the takes, and he starts jamming on the riff to sing a simple song by Sly and the Family Stone. And he's playing it like this. And then Common's playing. Now that riff, Billy Cobham and John McLaughlin then took they go into a room, the rehearsal room on their own, just drums and guitar, and they start to work it. And that turns out to be Noonwood Race. Miles still plays it, and that riff uh, crops up on um, Agata, it uh, uh, crops up on um, uh, Live at New York City, the li live in concert. And we even hear it in 1985 on the track One Phone Call. That riff, that riff, that is the birth of jazz rock on Jack Johnson, which I've got at number 13. At number 12, greater than Jack Johnson, because I think Jack Johnson's a bit patchy in places, <laughs> you know, but it's on. It's high up because it, 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 it brings in this genre. But number 12, an album which is perfect, uh, made in 1970, the same year as Jack Johnson, and in a way is another one of the great you know, innovative jazz rock albums that sets the sound is Hot Rats by Frank Zappa. And on this album, he's got Don Sugar Kane Harris, he's got Jean-Luc Ponty. This album comes in, out in 1970, and in 1971, um, John McLaughlin forms the Mavish Sure, He wants Jean-Luc Ponty, can't get them, so he brings in Jerry Goodman, and then we have that sound. How much is the Mavish Nocturne sound rooted in some part on this classic album by Frank Zappa, Hot Rats, which I've got at number 12. At number 11, I have Mysterious Traveller by Weather Report. Now, this is a bit of a strange one, right? I really feel that the Weather Report at their artistic peak in the mid-70s, and now a lot of people talk about Jaco Pastores, but I think Jaco Pastores unbalanced the sort of... Um, ineffective brilliance of the of weather report and i think weather report take for me take a while to get into their stride i'm, I'm not a massive fan of the first album. i know some people love it but i think that's people who like jazz and electric jazz and not like, like jazz rock uh, the second album's in incredible sweet night and they're on to something but on the album um which is come on you nearly done well on this you're nearly there on the album mysterious traveler from 1975 for can't quite remember on mysterious traveler the weather report sound is completely there there you have it on mysterious traveler it's a masterpiece of an album and it's got a darkness and a broodingness to it that you don't often get on the later weather report albums where it becomes all salt, sunshiny and carnival-y. Although that sounds there as well. So um, that's what I've got at, um, I've lost my place, at um, number 11. So we're into the top 10 now. Phew. How long have we been going for? God, this is a long one. Right, at number 10 I've got Emergency by Tony Williams Livesign. What can I say? 
you know, Tony Williams, here's John McLaughlin on a, on a recording that um, I think Jack to Johnette made. He hears this incredible British guitarist that's bringing in sort of rock and, and, and funk and jazz. He brings him over to New York in 1969. He ends up playing on In Your Silent Way, he plays on Bitches Brew, and he forms this band, Tony Williams Lifetime. Tony leaves Miles Davis's band, and on Tony Williams Lifetime, we see the beginnings of the solution to jazz rock because what he does is he takes a band which is actually electric. It's a jazz group, the organ trio, which is already electric. We've already heard it with Wes Montgomery. He brings in that electricity, amps it up, and he puts one of the greatest post-Jimmy um, Smith organists in the, in the world at that time, Larry Young and John McLaughlin on guitar. And they go in with no money, with an engineer that hasn't got a clue, and he, they make this almost like punk rock jazz album. It's badly recorded, the, the instruments are failing, it's got buzzes and sounds, it really sounds terrible, but in a way that dirtiness sets the seal for what's gonna happen in jazz rock at that point. One of the most important albums ever made, Emergency by Tony Wimps Lifetime. This is number 10. And number nine, Visions of the Emerald Beyond, the greatest of the second Marvish Nuxtures, the one with Nar Narada Michael Walden on drums. This is the second one after Apocalypse. What can I say? It is my favourite album. You can see I'm being objective here. If I wasn't being objective, that would be at number one. But it's not. It's at number nine. Because I know it's not as important as the Inner Mountain Flame. But the production and the playing and the sound and the soloing and the vision is absolutely unparalleled. This is a mountain peak of jazz rock. Vision of the Emerald Beyond, number nine. And number eight, Heavy Weather. The album that sold half a million copies when it came out because it had the hit record Birdland. And Birdland does have a very hooky riff, but it also is full-on Joe Zawinul composed jazz rock. And it's, it, it's controlled and it's deep. People think that this album's frivolous because it sold a lot. It's not. This is deep music. We've got Teen Town on there. We've got Havana on there. We've got um, um, Palladium. These are all, this is one of the great great um, fusion albums of all time. Every time I go back to Heavy Weather, it blows me away. I always forget how monumental it is. At number seven, Bitches Brew. Bitches Brew is Miles' big rock statement. Not in a silent way, it's Bitches Brew. It's not fully realized. He's, he's exploring something else with this huge band that is almost like the the the, the it's the class of jazz rock, isn't it? You know, you got Wayne Shorter, you got Bernie Maupin that's going to be in Herbie Hancock's band. You've got on drums Lenny White, Billy Cobbs at these sessions. We've got Jack DeJohnette. We've got like um, John McLaughlin. We've got Wayne Shorter. We, this is like the Dave Holland. This is like the, the, the class of jazz rock, right? Doing their final, you know, assessment before they were unleashed on the world to change the music world forever. Bitches Brew, an absolutely monumental album. And number six, I've got Romantic Warrior by Return to Forever. Again, a high watermark for jazz rock, but here we see the link between prog and jazz rock. You know, so as much as Chick Corea wants to channel the Mavish Nuxtra on this album, he also wants to channel, yes, you know, you can tell Stanley Clock's been listening to Chris Squire with admiration. And what we have in this beautifully engineered it's incredibly played it's like the mount i wanted mountain peaks at the top because often innovatory albums aren't mountain peaks they, they, they they're they're early and we've got a lot of innovatory albums on this list here as well but um, in terms of just as jazz rock perfection an ensemble playing at its peak romantic warrior by return to forever and number five i have got birds of fire this is really high up to start off with I, I've got number five, Birds of Fire. I didn't want all the top spots to be taken up by um, the Mavish structure. Wow, what can I say? It's just brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Birds of Fire. I'm not going to talk about it. It's too much. I can't, this is like, I can't, what am I supposed to say? I've said so much about these albums over this. Is, these, these, these are the great albums. What am I supposed to say about Birds of Fire? Oh, number four, Headhunters by Herbie Hancock. Not made in 1974, you know, Bill Summers on percussion, Paul Jackson on bass, Harvey Mason on drums, funky drumming, Herbie Hancock's on keyboard, Benny Maupin on saxophone. God, this is where the funk really peak, that's the mountain peak of funk jazz rock, his headhunters at number four. At number three, Black Market by Weather Report. 
absolutely monumental. My favourite Black, black um, Weather Report album, we got Jacko on there. Narada Michael Walden, again, he's all over the top of this. Sorry, my, sorry drummers, but Narada Michael Walden's my favourite drummer. He's all over the top of this, right? Sorry, that's the way it is. Narada, if you're watching, oh, what can I say? Um, at number two, um, I really thought about this deeply. And this would have been lower on my list, but I really do think it is the second greatest jazz rock album ever made. I really do. And number two, I've got Spectrum by Billy Cobham with the X Factor Tommy Bowling. So at number one, I have the album where jazz rock started and the album where this band never put a put foot wrong. It's like finding the jazz rock um, um, volcano. People are trying to find it. No. It's a bit like drilling for oil. This is a bit of metaphor. They're, so all the all the people are drilling for oil in the 60s. They're trying to find out how this will work. And then John McLaughlin with the Mavish Doctor drill for oil in 1971. And you get that great big gush fly out. And then it sets fire. And everyone steps back. Oh, what the hell is this? It's the inner mounting flame. Oh my God, that worked. Of course it is. The inner mountain flame. The bodies of dinosaurs there for a million years, soaking up the sun, the energy directly from the sun has been encased in the ground for years and years and years, waiting under pressure for the, for the exploratory mind of us human beings to drill down, deep down, deep down into the earth that represents it, it, it that re represents the mother, it represents the female, the sky representing the male, the earth, the mother earth, from where things are birthed. And what is birthed in this case when the, when the um, e exploratory spiritual seekeriness, the seekeriness of John McGoughlin as he plunges down into the depths, down into the unconscious, and eventually he finds that thing down below and the pressure, the pressure which is built up over millions of years of the energy that goes direct to the sun, which goes right direct to the infinite, that goes direct to, dark, to God. Bang! Out it comes! And with that, the flames, the inner mountain flame, the discovery, the discovery of what is inside us. That's what it was like for me when I first heard the Mavish Nostra. Oh, God. And I have reached the emotional climax of the video, which every good YouTube video should have. The other one, the prog one did it, but this one did. I've, I, I have done a better job on this video. I didn't stop, it's an hour and a half long. So if you've got to the end, give me a round of applause now. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. Yes, 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 it was, it was, it was nothing. It was a mere, a mere bagatelle of knowledge there for you. There we go. Done it. Didn't do too bad. Did I say anything wrong on there? Did I say any names wrong or miss anything out? I must have. I won't. I'll find out in the edit. But I tell you, it's just going out. It's just going out as it is. That's it. So if you've given me a round of applause for an hour and a half of doing that and the amount of bloody stuff I had to pull out of this old brain of mine to get through that and dates and names, all stupid stuff like that. If you think that was good, then stick a like on it, you ungrateful jazz rock fan. Stick a like on it and press subscribe. If you're watching this, you haven't subscribed. Look what I've just bloody done. Look what I've done. Ooh. Ungrateful, ungrateful jazz rock fans out there. There you are, lapping it up, lapping all the knowledge, lapping up all the, the, the metaphors that I came up with at the end. Who else is going to do that? Come on, who else does that who talks about jazz rock? Who else would come up with a metaphor that good at the end of the video? Like that off the top of their head? Come on, I'm getting angry now. I'm doing everything. You know, I've done the whole hour and a half and at the end you're getting a rant. And I'm ranting at you jazz rock fans. You, the you jazz rock, ungrateful jazz rock fans that haven't liked or subscribed to my channel. Come on, I'm near 20,000. Right, I'm, I've, got, I've got back... 1,200 to go. I can do it. I can do it if the ones of you watching this would just get your little mouse or your little finger and just press like and subscribe and then I can end up the year with saying I've hit 20,000 subscribers. Bloody hell, you little, 
a little ungrateful. Not, not the ones of you who subscribe. You're the nice ones. You're the good ones. You, 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 you haven't let me down. But you, you fair weather jazz rock fans, press bloody like and subscribe. And I tell you what you can do as a punishment for being so ungrateful. What you can do is you can go over to my Patreon, right, and you can join that for a month, right? I've got to get through Christmas. It's bloody hard at the moment in the way the world is. Come on, I've just an hour and a half here. I've hurt me back, right? And if you don't want to do that, but you still want to give me some money because you feel guilty, because you're a little ungrateful jazz rock fan, then you could go and put something in my YouTube tip jar, the PayPal tip jar. It's all there. Go, just give me some money to make yourself feel better. I know you feel guilty there. You know I'm working hard here, right? This is, this is quality entertainment. You know, I've got, I've got, I've got dogs smoking pipes here. Oh, I'm grateful. That's the trouble with jazz rock fans. Prog fans, anal retentive, but they're a nice bunch. Anal retentive, loners, you know, that have no friends. That's your, that's your average jazz rock fan, you know, sat there, you know, sorting out their sock jorts. That's a prog fan. Jazz rock fans, oh, ungrateful. Aren't they? Ungrateful. They never, they, 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 they don't think that they need they don't think they, that they need to show their... <laughs> it is just ridiculous. Oh, I'm trying to find a way of getting at the jazz rock fans, but I've got to be honest, they, they aren't... I can't... Prog fans have a certain thing about them, but jazz rock fans... What's the... What, what's the I mean, they're muso -y, so they're a bit snotty, aren't they? And they, they, they... But they're not that bad. It's not as bad as other... Musicians like jazz fans, they are really snotty. Jazz rock fans is like, they know that they, they're slumming it like in jazz rock. They know they should be listening to, I don't know, um, Bill Evans or something like that, but they'd rather just kick out, you know, with a Brecker Brothers album. Yeah, funny, funny bunch jazz rock album, but I don't really think you're ungrateful. I'm just being silly. Those of you, though, that haven't subscribed to my channel, you're bloody ungrateful watching my videos like this for nothing. For nothing. Sitting there, watching them for nothing. Right? Skin flints. That's probably what it is. If they're jazz rock musicians, they've got no money at all. That's what it is. They, you know, they have to slum it in some covers band, you know, getting all frustrated because really they want to get out on stage and play school days or, um, you know, um, Stratus. That's classic, is it? Number two on the list, you see. Oh, I'm done now. I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish and switch off, and I'm going to go away and uh, relax. I got through that. I'm, you can tell. I'm, you can tell by my ebullient, fake, you know, uh, ranting at the end. I'm quite chuffed that I've got through this hour and thirty-six minutes. Bloody hell, that was a long one. See you on the next one. Bye.